Welcome back to CVM Live. It's now time for our major stories in detail. Prime Minister Andrew Holness says the opportunities created by the government has boosted economic growth and development in the island. CVM Live's Khadija Thomas reports. Speaking at the quarterly press briefing at Jamaica House on Wednesday, the Prime Minister said the government did not meet all its targets for 2017, but the main objective of job creation has influenced growth in the island. It shows a working economy. It shows confidence that people are investing. But as I said last night at the Jamaica Stock Exchange annual forum, that employment is the people's stake in growth. This is how we ensure that the prosperity is equally shared. The Prime Minister added that this is a major achievement as the government undertakes economic reform programs in all sectors, specifically tourism and agriculture. The truth is that the Jamaican economy is still very dependent on agriculture. So anything that affects agriculture will affect the immediate outturns of economic growth. Nevertheless, we're growing. At least it's not zero and it is definitely not negative. So we, we didn't hit the, the target we wanted, but we're still doing uh, fairly well. Um, I think generally um, on the macroeconomic front, the economy is doing um, fairly well. Prime Minister Holness says Jamaica's economic climate has provided the right market conditions for investors. Confidence is the psychology of the economy. When people feel that the government is acting in a way that is certain, they will invest. And that's very important, as I said last night, that um, people who have resources and want to invest, want to know that if they invest and they go to bed tonight, they wake up tomorrow with the same tax rate. Khadija Thomas, CVM Live. Chairman of the Economic Growth Council, Mr. Michael Lee Chin, has asserted that crime is all that stands between a Jamaica that stagnates and the accomplishment of our economic growth goals. CVM Live's Joel Croskill reports on the EGC's fourth report to the nation. Chairman of the Economic Growth Council, Mr. Michael Lee Chin has applauded Prime Minister Andrew Holness for his decision to declare a state of emergency in St. James and went a step further by declaring Jamaicans must be ready to support a decision to expand its boundaries island-wide. I could not let this opportunity pass without commenting on the government's thrust, recent thrust, most recent thrust, to stave crime and criminality. I applaud the strength shown by declaring the public state of emergency. This is the first step which has to be supported by all citizens. We have to make our voices heard that we are not going to tolerate this anarchy and have to give the government 100% confidence that they can put the entire country under a public state of emergency if necessary to eradicate cancer, this cancer. The EGC chairman also declared that crime remains the final hurdle Jamaica must overcome if it is to be placed on a path to growth. Harnessing the crime monster is the last hill needed for us to climb. The economy is confident. The debt to GDP is coming down quickly. Our reserves are strong. Our dollar is stable. And investors are poised to start investing and creating jobs. Let's do all that is necessary to wrestle criminality and corruption to the ground. It is the only thing standing between stagnation and five in four. Mr. Leachin also spoke of some of the steps that have been taken by the council to help achieve that five in four goal. Over the last two quarters, we have continued to work assiduously and collaborated with several government, local and international entities to facilitate significant progress in reducing retardance to growth, such as, number one, unproductive bureaucracies. Number two, poor utilization of government-owned assets. Number three, limited harnessing of the power of the diaspora and friends of Jamaica. 
Number four, limited access to finance to SME. Number five, inadequate legislative tools to address the intolerable crime problem in this country. Joel Crosskill, CVM Live. The legal battle between Director of Elections, Arid Fisher, and the Electoral Commission of Jamaica came to a standstill today following the revelation of a conflict of interests. CVM Live's Nikoi Wilson reports. Director of Elections, Oret Fisher, is challenging the Electoral Commission of Jamaica as he says his one-year appointment as the election boss was illegal because the law clearly states that the appointment must be for seven years. His challenge comes after his contract was set to expire on October 31, 2017. The matter was delayed on Wednesday following the disclosure of Justice and Simmons of her friendship with Solicitor General Nicole Foster Pusey. Mr. Fisher's attorney, Hugh Wildman, commended Justice Simmons for the revelation and consulted with his client to ascertain if he would be willing to move forward with the matter. Mr. Wildman said his client was uncomfortable with the idea, citing that it would not be in the interest of justice if Simmons remained as the presiding judge. The Solicitor General, in her response, said the legal fraternity is very small and so it is likely that judges and attorneys would know each other. Soon after, Mr. Wildman indicated that his client, who seemed eager to have the matter heard immediately, was willing to proceed with Justice Simmons as the presiding judge. However, Justice Simmons decided not to proceed because Mr. Fisher had already expressed reservations. She says there must never be any question of bias, and if she proceeds, then it would be unnecessarily cumbersome. Immediately following this decision, the clerk of the court was sent to the registrar to find out if any judge present in the precinct would be able to deal with the matter. When the clerk returned, she indicated that the registrar was requesting the file. No sooner than the clerk attempted to leave the courtroom did Mrs. Foster Pusey say that it would be very inconveniencing for a judge to receive the matter to deal with at this time, a point with which Mr. Wildman agreed. Subsequently, the hearing has been set for February 26. Nicoy Wilson... CVM Live. Bishop Rowan Edwards led a march through Spanish Town Bus Park where he called for an end to the murders in Spanish Town and for gunmen to turn themselves over to the church. CVM Live's Joel Croskill reports. Bishop Rowan Edwards, chairman of the Spanish Town Revival, led hundreds of congregants through the bus park in Spanish Town, calling out for peace in Jamaica. He expressed frustration at the over 100 murders that were committed in Spanish Town during the course of 2017. We are fed up of the wickedness that is taking place in our country. 1,600 plus people have been killed across our country. In Spanish Town alone, 135. Of course, it dipped last year by at least 12%. But 12% is not good enough for Spanish Town. Our bus park is stained with blood. Taxi drivers are being wiped out. And we cannot continue like this. The bishop also had a message to the gunmen that continue to terrorize sections of Spanish town. I'm saying to you gunmen, what good is this doing to you? It's only helping you. It's not helping your community. You're mashing up our town, man. And the church across Spanish town and across this country is praying against you. And we are saying you better repent. You better come and know God. If I catch you, I won't give it to the police. Let me tell you what I'll do with you. I'll have you baptized. Give me a gun and I'll give you a Bible. He is calling on citizens across the island to play a proactive role in driving the criminal scourge from their hiding places. It is totally wrong. Come on, church, say it's wrong. It's wrong. It's wrong. It's wrong. It's wrong. It's wrong. For people to be killing off one another. It's time for us to live as one. Why just a few men killing off the masses? And the masses keep quiet and watch the mayhem taking place. I'm calling all Jamaicans, let's rise up from Negril Point to Moran Point. Let's block our streets and call back this country to sanity. Joel Crossgill, CVM Live. 
Lasco Manufacturing Limited has secured factory space to form a new company that will manufacture cannabis products for medicinal use. CVM Live's Khadija Thomas has more in this report. The announcement was made by the chairman of Lasco Affiliated Companies, the Honorable Lassels Chin, at a press briefing at the company's White Mar location in St. Catherine on Wednesday. Chin says he's awaiting the approval of government ministries to manufacture and export the cannabis products worldwide, but has already received requests from overseas territories. Potential purchasers have visited us from Australia interested in placing large orders, not only for CDB water, but for all the medicinal products. And cries have started to come in from several territories such as Canada, Italy, Europe, and Ukraine, who want to know when we will be able to supply them with the various products. They are pressing us for supplies. The chairman says that Lasco's involvement with cannabis is strictly for medicinal purposes and their partnership with United Cannabis, you can, will provide the platform for the company to supply cannabis products. We are currently finalizing the partnership agreement. This one-third venture between LASVAC, United Cannabis, and Can Cannabis Wide Research and Development, CRD, will see LASCO being responsible for manufacturing the products. UCAN will be responsible for all the expertise and research of, and the patents, and CRD will be responsible for growing, processing, and research. Meanwhile, Managing Director of UCAN, Ernie Blackman, says their partnership with LASCO will be beneficial to Jamaicans. We will empower the farmer, the doctors, and the patients. The farmer, by supplying desirable genetics with organic growing techniques, the doctors with new and novel medications for many ailments, and the patients with a path to wellness. Khadija Thomas, CVM Live. Prominent Western businessman Dennis Meadows is calling for improved investigative capacity from the security forces, which he believes will act as a deterrent to violent crimes. CVM Live's Joel Croskill reports. Former senator and businessman Dennis Meadows continues to propose a number of reforms which he believes will strengthen the achievements of the state of emergency. I believe that this declaration must be sustained. The last time in 2010 when we declared one, it was the victim of, of, of narrow politics, where the then opposition sought not to support the extension. I think we dropped the ball there. I hope that good sense will prevail in this matter, and the opposition will join forces with the government to ensure that this state of emergency is sustained and, if needs be, extended to other troubled areas. The former deputy chairman of the Firearm Licensing Authority also spoke of the investigative capacity of the police and how, if it were improved, criminals may not be as willing to risk committing their crime. Until we improve our investigative capacity to feed the perception that anybody likely to commit a crime will be caught within 72 hours, then what we have here will continue. We must instill in the minds of these undesirables that if you commit a crime, the likelihood of you being caught within 72 hours is very high. Nonetheless, he admits reform is needed within the constabulary force. That is not to say that there's no problem within the police force. The police force, in my view, needs serious reformation, revamping. And in my view, I believe that while there, I know there are hard working men and women in the force who get up every day with the resolve to do their job, there are a number of police men and women out there by their own actions are feeding this crime. And let's be fair about it, especially in Montego Bay. Let's be real. Joel Crossgill. CVM Live. Several residents of West Kingston descended on the Justice Ministry on Constant Spring Road earlier today, citing that they have not been compensated. CVM Live's Nikoi Wilson reports. Public defender reside now. I was shot, no compensation, and pay me what you owe me now were some of the messages on the placards of Tivoli residents as they lined the walls of the Justice Ministry on Wednesday afternoon. 
But why were they there? They all say they have not been compensated by the Justice Ministry. Member of the Tivoli Committee, Lord Diagla, says Justice Minister Delroy Chok is uninformed about the compensation process and needs to get up to speed. He holds the view that the people were not properly informed about the compensation process. And as a result of that, the compensation process was flawed and it inevitably led to 2,000 people who should be compensated not being compensated and that is totally unacceptable. Tivoli Gardens resident Nicola Bryce Wilson, who says she was shot in the left breast and left foot, says no one told her why she hasn't been compensated. She took with her proof. Because the bullet, I have the evidence. So it's not like that I don't have any evidence. I have the evidence. This is the bullet in my left breast. This is the bullet in my left breast and in my left foot. I know the scary on my body and nothing, nothing. One other resident, George Harriot, says he was told he could not be compensated because he was unable to identify his shooter. The people of Tivoli Gardens are demanding a meeting with the Justice Minister to address their concerns. Nicoy Wilson, CVM Live. Time now for regional and international news. Thanks, Richard. Now for news in the region. On Tuesday, the Council of the European Union removed eight jurisdictions, including Barbados, Grenada and Panama, from the EU's list of non-cooperative jurisdictions for tax purposes, following commitments made at a high political level to remedy EU concerns. The Council agreed that a delisting was justified in the light of an expert assessment of the commitments made by these jurisdictions to address deficiencies identified by the EU. In each case, the commitments were backed by letters signed at a high political level and in Trinidad and Tobago. Commissioner of Prisons in the Twin Island Republic, Gerard Wilson, says an investigation has been launched into videos on social media showing prison officers beating inmates who appeared to be restrained. CTV Trinidad has this report. In a phone interview with CNews this morning, Commissioner Wilson said the first order of business was to authenticate the footage. He said the fact that the officers' faces were obscured makes identifying them a bit of a challenge. Commissioner Wilson said the prison service takes such issues very seriously. Prison officers are guided by a use of force policy, which stipulates that once the inmates are subdued, the force must stop. Former USA gymnastics doctor Nairi Nassau was sentenced to 40 to 175 years in prison after admitting to 10 counts of criminal sexual conduct. Here's more from Al Jazeera. The staggering sentence mattered less than the statement it made. Wow. You're strong. What have you done? Dr. Larry Nasser was already handed a 60-year prison term for related child pornography last month that will keep the 54-year-old away from children for life. Perhaps you have figured it out by now, but little girls don't stay little forever. They grow into strong women that return to destroy your world. He pleaded guilty to molesting seven girls in USA Gymnastics and Michigan State University through intimate treatments that he told them had therapeutic value. 2009. She took her own life because she couldn't deal with the pain anymore. But he was accused by more than 150 women. That's it for regional and international news. I am Nicole Wilson. Back to you, Richard. Those are the major stories this evening. More coming your way. News Live in 5 with Joel Croskill. But up next is our panel discussion. And this evening, we look at the ever-present issue of justice.